But I want to talk about Noah tonight, some of the lessons we can learn from him, but also some of the challenges. By faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make the length of the ark. 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Noah, a man with a message. But he was more than that. He was a man who walked with God. The first thing we see about Noah, or we find out about him, is that his father was Lamech. Lamech, a descendant of the line of Seth, of the godly line came, that comes down from Adam. And his name, Lamech, means overthrower. But that Lamech is not to be confused with another Lamech in Genesis 4, the descendant of Cain who, killed, uh, Cain who killed Abel, Lamech, that Lamech, had two wives and he killed a man. That Lamech had the same haughty spirit and disregard for human life as Cain did. Now, our Lamech, Noah's father, was of that godly line of Seth. He taught his son, I believe, respect for God respect for the life that was in him from God. And Lamech lived, he lived 777 years and he died just five years before the flood. Lamech's father was Methuselah. We all know Methuselah by reputation, the oldest man living. He died in the year of the flood Noah himself lived to be 950 years old. He's the third oldest recorded man living, or lived. But it's interesting, I think, to note that both Lamech and Methuselah were around during the time of Adam. I can just imagine them sitting around together around a log fire talking and Adam telling them all the stories of the garden. And I think Adam would have told them about God. He'd have described the garden. He'd have talked to them and told them about the, the serpent, told them about the tree and the apple or the fruit. He would have told them, I think, about his encounter with Satan. So they had first-hand knowledge of what uh, happened to Adam. But Lamech, he had a son, Noah, and he named him, well, he named him Noah, as you know. And it means he will comfort us in the labour and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Shortened, it means rest. We will have rest. But nothing is known about Noah for the first 500 years of his life. And then the thing that we learn first about him, that he had three children, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And around that time, God looked down on, the, on mankind, and he saw the 
the wickedness of the then world, of the, of the children of God, the, the people of God, those that had, had gone astray. It was so wicked and violent and corrupt that it says, and we've read that, he, he regretted that he'd made man. And his heart was filled with pain. And he grieved, God's heart grieved that he'd made man or they'd seen his, his creation fall to this level. Can you imagine God's heart when he saw that? How would you feel if your children, your sons, your daughters went off and they were corrupt and, and violent? Your heart would break. And that was God's heart. So Noah lived in a society just like our own. Just like our own today. Corrupt, deceitful, greedy, selfish, with little respect for God or even for human life. There are some atrocious things going on around the world. And you read the reports as I do. It was a time of moral darkness. It hadn't taken long for this to happen, for man to go off the rails. But scripture records that Noah walked with God. There was a family that maintained their godly line and they were clean before God. Can you imagine Noah walking with God going out for a walk uh, in the morning in the countryside a meeting with God and walking with God it says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day well as I see this it, it says that Noah walks habitually with God so I think he walked out every day getting to know God and know God's heart but imagine walking and being intimate with Almighty God, and then one day God says to him, I'm going to destroy the world. I'm going to annihilate the, the, the mankind. God confided in Noah. There was that special relationship which allowed God to do that. Noah had found favour with God because of his, his clean walk. The, when it says, um, you know, we'll get to that. <laughs> but they discussed, God discussed plans that he had for the ark. And it gives him explicit dis uh, instructions as to how to build it. Detailed instructions about the, 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 the dimensions and the structure, the size and the shape. And that's the first lesson I find, or the first lesson that I found for me. When you spend time with God, you begin to get, or you get a different perspective on things around. There was a lawyer once who asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in law? And Jesus said, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, this is the first commandment. If you notice there, mind comes last. It's heart, soul, and it says with all your mind, with all your strength. If the heart doesn't believe the truth, knowledge won't force its way in. God's knowledge won't force its way. If you don't believe the truth, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, it won't do you much good. Without the love of God in our hearts, we are empty vessels. Churchgoers, Christians with all Bible knowledge, but without full and hungry hearts for love of God, they've got the knowledge but if their hearts haven't grasped first the love of God, and it's not just, oh, I love God, 
and so I'd go to church. And you're filled with knowledge. No, it's it, the love of God is it goes after God so that your heart and your soul is filled with God. You remember when you fell in love with your wife? I remember when it happened to me. My heart was full of love for Gloria. It wasn't just a, oh, I'm happy, <laughs> let's go out. I proposed to her after three days. She'd gripped my heart. And that's what we need with God. It's, it's got to be more than just walking with God and sitting in a pew on Sunday and gaining knowledge. That we've all been in church for many years, decades. We've got all the knowledge. But our challenge, I see, from, 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 the, from uh, Noah is that he, he spent time with God, not just reading the scriptures or our daily reading on a Monday morning or a Tuesday every morning, but it's that heart grasp for God. That's what we need. We've got to take going after God, our way of life, seeking, spending time, talking with and bonding with him in intimate relationship. We don't get that on a Sunday morning, once a week. Proud, knowledge-filled, I've got here arrogant Christians, but Christians, churches are full of them. I, I confess I've been like that. I've been a churchgoer with knowledge. But the scripture says of them, they are noisy, noisy gongs and clanging cymbals. 1 Corinthians 13. It's love that drives the heart and the soul to go after God. And when we've got God and our hearts are full of his love and our soul is full of him, I used to speak on having a fat soul. And that's having God in your heart and filling you, thrilling you. If we don't have that, knowledge is useless. It's God that we need, not knowledge. And Noah was such a man. He'd spent 500 years listening to his father and to his grandfather listening to their stories and he'd been waiting on God, yes. He wanted to know. He wanted the knowledge. He had great regard for God. And he spent time. Something happened, I think, to Noah at about 500 years. It's then recorded that had his children. And it's after that that God spoke to him. So I wonder whether he had a, a real encounter with God at about that time. 500 years, he lived to 950. It's about halfway through his life. And then he started. God trusted him. He saw his heart. And he found favour with God. God trusted him. Chose him for a task. To build an ark. But it was more than that. But an ark, no one had ever built an ark. They had no concept of what an ark was or would be. There must have been, Noah must have had many meetings with God. It took over a hundred years to build the ark. When he started out, I should think he wondered what it was he was building. It was so big, it was bigger than anything he knew. He didn't know what a boat was. But he had times of fellowship with living God. And he built a relationship. He built a friendship. And there became intimacy and trust on both sides. God began to trust Noah. And Noah believed and he heard and he believed and he, he trusted God. His walk became deeper. And with a deeper relationship, you gain knowledge of the other person. You gain knowledge of their heart. You, you know and begin to understand their thoughts and their inner feelings. It's the same in marriage, isn't it? Oftentimes, we'll know what we're thinking, what our partner's thinking. And this is like this with God. As you spend time with God, you begin to know his heart. 
You feel his heart. And Noah saw that. He saw God's perspective. And he felt God's burden of grief. He was a man with a burden. But he'd been chosen for a purpose. And I believe that we're all chosen for a purpose. God has plans for all of our lives, each of us. We may be just ordinary people. There's nothing special about me. Probably nothing special about any one of us. But you know, there was nothing special about Noah. He was just an ordinary man. But it says that he was perfect. And when it says it's perfect, it doesn't mean morally. It meant in his, in his line he'd kept himself, his family kept themselves clean from all that was going on in the world around them. The word used there was, uh, it's, it's tamin. And it means without blemish. Technically that's bodily and physical perfection. As I say, not moral perfection. But it suggests that Noah and his family preserved their pedigree. Kept, in pu kept it pure in spite of the prevailing corruption brought about society and the falling an fallen angels that were around at the time. Picture the scene on earth. Just think about it. It was a time when the Nephilim, the fallen angels, walked the earth and men lived to be six, seven, eight hundred years old and the population had begun to multiply and the women were beautiful. That's what they saw. That's what the sons of God saw. And so much that they began to cohabit with them. And Noah saw all this. And his, his father and his grandfather, they saw all these things happening. They saw that, the, that humankind was, was, was doing things contrary to, to God's plan. They saw these things. <coughs> the people had become, it says, very corrupt. Wickedness was very great in the earth and every imagination and intention of all human thinking was only evil continually. God regretted that he'd made man. He saw and his heart was grieved. So he decided to destroy the world and to blot out mankind. Now, Noah's grandfather, Enoch, was a righteous man. And Jude tells us that he had warned his generation of God's anger. And he prophesied and he said, God will bring the people of the world to judgment and convict the ungodly of their deeds. That was Noah's grand great-grandfather. And Noah preached righteousness. But he was just a man. But he was a man who found favour with God. I suppose the challenge is there. Have we found favour with God? You and I. That demands time it's spent in relationship. Noah preached righteousness, as I said. Scripture says that he walked habitually in fellowship with God. I like to think that we do. We spend, or and I spend time praying every day. We try to live our lives according to his will and his plan and his purposes for us. And we've seen God's hand in our lives many times, and I'm sure you have. But I want more of God. I want more of God. I want my, my heart cries for God. I don't, I don't want to be a great preacher like <laughs> Noah became. But I know that I want more of God. I want to hear his heart. So I've been challenged. It was out of that, fellow, that fellowship and that relationship that the relationship grew that time that he spent with God every day. He had a heart and a soul filled with the love of God. But it was love that drove that. And God revealed his will. God revealed what he was going to do. 
It had 500 years of knowledge, growing to understand. And now he had a heart, a heart's knowledge. Heart's knowledge of God's grief and his plans for salvation. God explained his plans for salvation. He told Noah to build an ark. But he was an ordinary man. God chooses ordinary men, ordinary people. I'm sure you'll know these. But he chooses men and women who keep themselves clean and have a heart full of the love of God. Gideon was a common labourer. Deborah was a housewife. Moses had speech impediment. Esther was an orphan. David was a shepherd. Matthew was a civil servant. You see, don't, we don't have to be special. Just ordinary with a heart and soul full of the love of God. God uses those who are available to him then. Those he can trust. In Noah's time the land was corrupt and it was filled with violence. God saw it. He saw how degenerate and debased and vicious it was. Humanity had lost its direction and God was grieved that he had made man. So he confided in Noah. He said, I'm going to wipe out all mankind and take them off the face of the earth. Total destruction. How would he handle such a burden? How would he, how would he understand what that meant? But God told him. And he revealed that he had a plan for Noah. You see, when this happened and God said that, he was going to wipe out mankind, he didn't see a lost world. God saw the birth of a nation, Israel. God was looking ahead. He saw the corruption and there would be judgment. But he saw beyond that, he saw the time of a nation that would carry his name. So that's another lesson, really. Noah met with God every day. He preached righteousness to his community, did that for a hundred years, without result. Not a single convert, convert Nobody else went with him in the, in the ark. Not a single convert in a hundred years. I guess that, was, that could be pretty depressing. But he obeyed God. He was faithful to God. He'd seen the condition of his fellow countrymen. He saw what God had seen. And he was equally horrified. And it stirred his soul. It compelled him to preach righteousness. But it was only when Noah saw what God saw that God could entrust him with a task. A task of building an ark, the ark of salvation. So it's only when we see what God sees that God can trust us with the big things. A lesson here, as what I've just said, it's only when we see God, and when we see as God sees that we can see the bigger picture. You remember at the wedding, Jesus didn't see jars of water. Jesus saw jars of the best wine and an abundance of wine. With the feeding of the 5,000, he didn't just see hungry crowds and five loads and two fish. He saw abundance. He saw a feast. And they took up 12 baskets of the overflow. And that lame man by the pool, he didn't seem lameness. He saw health and a whole man. And on the seashore when he rose again, he didn't see empty nets when Peter was out there fishing. He saw an abundance of fish. The lesson is we've got to learn to see situations through the eyes of Jesus. 
we've got to find that place where we understand his heart and our hearts are filled to overflowing with love and our souls are expansive and they grasp hold of God. Then, we see, then we'll see things through the eyes of Jesus. We'll see what he sees. We'll receive his heart and his vision of things. Can you just imagine getting up one morning and having a quiet time with God and then hearing that God was going to destroy the human race? Just think of the enormity of that. What would you do? If you wake up tomorrow morning and you hear God's voice, he says, I'm going to destroy you. Not you and your family, but I'm going to destroy the human race. What would you do? What could you do? But we all know that God has told us that's going to happen. This world is going to end. There's going to be a finality. It's coming to an end and it's near. I used to believe when I was much younger that in my generation... God, Jesus would return. I still carry that hope because there's a scripture to that effect. I believe that, but if it happens in my generation, what am I going to do? What can I do? That was the condition for Noah. He was told to build an ark, something he'd never seen never built before he got no blueprint no experience but he listened to God he listened to God he only had God's word and trust he trusted God God talked to me about flood waters flood waters what are flood waters he didn't know all he knew was the dew in the morning. An ark? What's an ark? And God would describe it to him. But you know, sometimes God asks us to do something we've never done before. So the lesson I learned from that was listen to what God says and act on what God says because that's all he asks. He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants obedience. Obedience to his word. So when he reveals things to us, it's up to us to act. In the storm, he said to Peter, step out of the boat and walk on water. But it was left to Peter to do that. He could have stayed in the boat. At the wedding, as I said, he told the disciples to fill the jars with water. It was left to the disciples to act. They had to do something. And in the boat, he told him to fish on the other side. Peter had to act. So I see that it's in the obedience to God's word. As we listen to hear his voice, as we wait upon him to obey. Noah preached righteousness. The people, the people around, they wanted to party and to indulge in all forms of wickedness and sexual wantonness. Noah was seen as a killjoy, always spoiling the party. He wasn't a popular man, I don't think. He was known as a party pooper. A party pooper. But he was a man in touch with God. He was in touch with God. And he'd been given a task. His battle, I think, was against the gods and rulers of his world. The same as it is today. Another one of the books of Jonathan Kahn that I've read recently... 
it's just newly been published, is the return of the gods. And he shows how the ancient gods have returned to this world and what effects they're having on society around the world, but specifically in America and the Western world. He didn't have an easy job. He was faced with telling his generation about the consequences of their actions, confronting their sin. Preached for a hundred years, took him that long to build the ark. It was no easy job. The people would call it Noah's folly and they would laugh at him. They would ridicule him, continually making jokes at his, his expense. But Noah knew the reality of what was coming because he had God's ear. He knew what's coming. He was a man who talked with the living God. He met with the site agent every morning and received his instructions for the day. You see, he'd caught the vision. He knew God's heart. Noah trusted God. He called his friend even when that made him unpopular. And so I asked myself, are we prepared to go that far? Noah's faith was seen in his actions. His faith came from the strength of his relationship with God. It wouldn't allow him to indulge in society and all that was going on around him. And if we mean business with God, we must make a stand in our society, the things that are going on in our world, here in the UK. Even if it makes us unpopular. And this is what I find, I think, with the church per se at large, as they try to be all things to everyone. And they don't preach the strong message of the kingdom of God. Repent of your sin. Much of the preaching that we've heard is that of um, love and forgiveness. It's not about the brimstone of fire, of hell. We seem to have lost that message. It's time the church got back to it. There's a time, and I think if we did, the churches would become full again. I think people, once they hear the consequences of their actions, will respond, although they didn't in Noah's time. It's a tough job. But Noah started to build. And I wonder if he tried to convince the local labourers and skilled craftsmen to help and he'd have to explain, well, I'm going to build an ark. An ark? What's an ark? Well, there's going to be a flood. A flood? What's a flood? Rain? What do you mean? And they'd laugh and scoff at him. You see, I think those things were outside of their experience. They didn't understand. And I imagine they turned him down. There was no converts on the ark, as I've said. So probably he and his family built most of the ark between them. That's why it took 100 years. But how did he find this inspiration? It's through his intimate times of fellowship with Almighty God. You know, Noah wasn't an evangelist until he'd heard from God, until he caught the vision. He wasn't an evangelist in that first 500 years. He was faced with a ta task, and that task was going to change the world. And there's a change coming to our world when everything will be altered. And this time it won't be a flood. This time the world will be destroyed by fire and nuclear bombs. Zechariah 14. Noah was ready when the flood came. Why? Because he listened and he believed. 
He enjoyed God's confidence. You know, when you've got... At work, if you enjoy your boss's confidence, it inspires you to do better, doesn't it? I hope it did <laughs> when we were at work. When your boss says, well done, and he encourages you, you it inspires you to, do, to go the extra mile, to do a bit more. Well, God, but Noah had God's confidence. And he loved God. His heart was full of his love for God. So I say to you and to me, are we ready for the change that's coming? Are we ready? Noah was God's mouthpiece to a degenerate generation. The challenge is for us, will we be the mouthpiece and speak for God now in our generation? I don't know how we can do that. We can do it in our local churches and our daily lives. I don't know how God could use each one of us, but I think we've got to be ready for that challenge. I think largely Christianity today dwells upon the positive and the encouraging and sermons like that. And they're all about love and forgiveness. And they're good in their place. I'm not decrying them. They're right in their place. But ministers don't seem to recognise the fierce spiritual battle that we're in. I think that we were born for battle. We not, might not like that concept, but I think we were born for battle. It's a spiritual battle, and we must be prepared. Only Noah and his immediate family listened, and they took Noah seriously enough. And there must be a lesson in that for us. It was his family that that came with him into the, into the ark. And there's a priority, I think, for our families. We need to tell them. Noah was a believer. He was brought up in a family that honoured God. Lamech lived while Adam was alive and he overlapped. He outlived uh, Adam by 56 years. Grandfather Methuselah was alive and he overlapped Adam by 270 years. As a boy, Noah heard from his father and his grandfather and he listened when they told him about the Garden of Eden, about the serpent, the forbidden tree and the apple. He knew of great-grandfather Enoch. He'd walked with, he knew that he'd walked with God and then he disappeared. And Noah would have been influenced by those stories, I've no doubt. And we've all sat for years in pews and we've got all the Bible knowledge and we've been influenced by them. Noah heard all the stories, he was full of knowledge, but not the knowledge that drove him. Sorry, it wasn't the knowledge that drove him. It was after he had an experience with Jehovah, with Yahweh. Something happened. He had a close encounter with God, I believe. Something stirred his heart. He heard God's call. He developed a relationship with God, not just knowledge that he'd had from the past, but he, he, he had relationship. He, he, beca he began to know God's heart and he made his own decision, like we would say being born again. He, want, he waited on God and he went after God with heart and soul. And it says of him that he found favour with God. When time was right, God said, go and tell the people. Go and tell the people, there's a flood coming. It was then that he stepped into the supernatural. When he knew God's heart, then he started to build. He took God at his word. He trusted and he preached righteousness and he built an ark took courage, took great courage in the face of a wicked generation. When he started, it took a long time coming, that flood. The people had plenty of warning, but only eight were saved. And it'll be like that next time. 
Only those who believe will be saved. Noah received his reward. Faith always brings its reward. It finds its fulfilment in God's promises. What the scriptures say in Hebrews, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. What does that mean? It means that what God did for Noah, he'll do for you, he'll do for me. Noah had relationship. Do you want relationship beyond that Sunday morning <clears throat> attendance at church? Where your heart and soul is not satisfied unless you receive more from God? That's what Noah had. Noah had revelation. Do you want revelation? I'm speaking to my own heart. If we want revelation, we need to know God's heart. We've got to become closer to God. Noah received his reward. And to receive ours, it requires faith and relationship. Trust in God. Noah was a man of faith. He was God's man with a message. Born for battle. Will you, will I, will we accept the challenge? I'll leave that for you to think on. Thank you for listening.